without any practice? Or would you rather speak every language? You understand it all, you speak it all. So go ahead and give me, give me your, your answer in the chat. Now, if I was in class, I would be counting my students. And so I would say, oh, you know, I go uno, dos, tres, and I would count and I would say, oh, 12 people, 12 people want to play every instrument. I would go write it up on the board and all of this would be in the target language. And then I would count, da, 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 da. oh, 18 people want to speak every language. And then I would reveal which one I pick and I pick every language, though it is a difficult um, question for me. And then we compare the numbers. So it's a good chance to practice numbers in like an authentic manner. And then I can ask the por qué, the why question. So usually I'll say, if you picked, and again, all in the target language, play every instrument and you want to say why, raise your hand. And so the students would then, I would usually get one student, at least one, usually five or six, that want to say why they pick play every instrument. Is there anyone that would want to say why they pick play every instrument? Is anyone feeling brave enough on a Saturday? You don't even need to turn your screen on. Got to give a little um, so my grandpa actually played uh, lots of instruments. Uh, he built his own marimba. Ooh. And he fixed all kinds of different instruments. So for me, it'd be play an instrument because he's close to my heart. Oh, Christina, it was such an amazing story. So beautiful. Thank you for sharing it with us. I really love that. Um, in class, and I, that, that was very touching, I would go and let a few other students answer that, but then I would go to the other side and I would say, who would like to speak every language? And is there anyone that wants to say, por qué, because I teach Spanish, why? Is anyone willing to share why they picked every language? Okay, I'll let you escape without answering that one since it's a Saturday. There we go. I got some in the chat. Yay, thank you. Because we live in a global world, because I love reading and there are so many books in other languages. I love both of those. I can talk to many people. I love all of those. For me, it's the ability to travel everywhere and the doors that unlocks when you speak the language and you understand the culture and you understand where you're going. Those are huge for me. But just within those few minutes, within the class, listening to each other, and hearing these, these deeper connections is starts to build a community and starts to help students to see each other in ways that they hadn't before. Like that was such an interesting fact Christina shared with us about her, her grandfather. And if I hadn't asked this question, I would never have known that. When I do these, I oftentimes will have like my student, like my like my student notes open. And if I hear something really interesting, I'll jot it down next to the student's name. And then I'll bring that fact up later in a story or if that student's like having a hard time. Like if I knew Christina, and I'm sorry, Christina, to use you as an example, but that was such a beautiful uh, comment you shared. If I knew Christina was having a hard time, then maybe her grandfather's marimba shows up in a story in the future. So you can use this information not only to get your students listening to each other and seeing each other as people, but also to, to build community and to give yourself, you know, information for future lessons. Now, I let my students answer, um, we, we raise our hands to answer, but I also let them answer, they can write something down and pass it in for me because not everyone is ready to talk in front of the class and that's okay too. Vote, count, and ask why, and I already said that part. If you cannot think of questions, you can Google what if questions for kids and you will get hundreds and hundreds. And that's why I started with picking ones from there. And then I actually at the end of class a few times was like, oh, who has some good what if, what if questions for me? And we had like two minutes and the kids, you know, in teams came up with their own list of what if questions. So I have tons and tons of them. Um, and these are some of the favorite ones from my students. Travel forward or backward in time. Pancakes or French toast, that was very controversial. Um, eat sushi or tacos, also very controversial. Soda or water. And then blue hair or purple hair. And I happen to have a blue wig and the music teacher had a pink wig, which they loved because then we came to school with the hair they voted for the next day. And they thought that was special. Doing the either or questions also gives you this opportunity to talk to your students about how everyone in the world is different and it's our differences. Yes, we all have things about us that are the same, like we all need family and shelter and food and all of these basics, but it's the things about us that are different 
that make the world an interesting place. And when I start these, I always give this speech, you know, if we all had blonde hair and blue eyes and green shirts and wore pajama pants when they could, and we all ate cereal for breakfast and sushi for lunch and pizza for dinner, and we all celebrated the same holidays and rooted for the same sports team and watched the same shows, I say, would the world be an interesting place? And I have taught thousands of students. I have never had even some of my sarcastic ones be like, yeah, it would be awesome. They all start to get it. And then I tell them it's our differences that often make the world an interesting place. And it's our differences in listening to each other that help us grow ideas and make the world a better place. And so these actually help start kind of like the, the whole, like, like the, the core of the classroom. They kind of help you set the stage. So Chris did a great job of introducing me, but I just threw that up there because I want you to know I'm not just making this up off the top of my head. I have had lots of experience, 18 years in the classroom with every grade from pre-K to eighth, and um, I'm a mom to three. And so I get to kind of practice language tricks with my own kids too and see what works as they develop their language. Oh, and Martha says these questions can be created by the daily communications that take place during the class. Yes, that's another great way to bring up the questions. And she also said she put her students put answers on GoGuardian, which is also wonderful. So classroom community. Today we're going to get into the why, the how, and then I'm going to give you a bunch of things that you can go and use in your classroom next week if you want that are all extremely low to no prep, which I know is really important, especially right now. And this was my my class um, at Harvest. This is their last year. I had these kids from pre-K to third grade. And this student right here made a Spanish shirt every year that he loved so much. And his last year was last year at Harvest. And all the kids were sad to leave Spanish. And that just made my heart warm. OK. So I really first started, and I think this is kind of an important little story, though I'm going to go fast, thinking deeply about classroom community when I taught a class, an eighth grade class. Um, called academic support. And I taught mostly Spanish, but I had one class of academic support. And they gave me 10 kids who were basically failing most of their classes. And they said, make these kids pass their classes. And that was the only guidance I had. And so one of the things I decided to do was I wanted them to see how school was important to them. So I had them have some sort of contact, whether it was an interview or a job shadow, with someone who does the profession that they wanted to do. And two of my kids wanted to be um, wildlife photographers, which is something I wanted to do when I was a kid. So I was super excited. So I emailed a bunch of National Geographic photographers and I got Matthew Paley, who is a French photographer, to Skype with my students. Now, he was fascinating. He was so good that my eighth graders who were my Spanish students heard about it from my kids in my academic support class and they demanded that we Skype with them too. And I had 50 eighth graders in my room at lunch voluntarily to listen to him speak. And what Matthew said that was so amazing um, has to do with his pictures. Now, Matthew works in the greater Himalayas. He works with cultures that are endangered, um, sometimes because of uh, like the the planet and what's going on and he what people always find fascinating with his pictures is that you can look at them and you can almost feel the story you don't they're not just a picture you can see kind of into their lives and people always ask him you know how do you make your your pictures so meaningful how do you make them so deep and he said it's because I listen to them I don't go up and just take a picture I take the time to hear their stories and then he proceeded to tell my students you don't need to go to the greater Himalayas to hear some stories and to make some connections and to learn some things you'll never need to, you've never known. You can go across the street or you can even just look across the classroom at a student you've never talked to. And the, the tingles, I mean, everyone was so intent and it, it just, it's, it's really a beautiful thing. When we listen to each other, we can build community in ways that we never, never imagined. So another bonus of building community in your classroom is it gives students a chance to talk to them to each other and to listen to each other. The most compelling topic to everyone is our own self and our relationship to others. A Harvard study shows we talk about ourselves 60% of the time in conversation and 80% of the time on social media. It lights up parts of our brain associated with reward like good food or for me coffee. Coffee is very very important for me. The mentalizing system retains information and stores it better than the prefrontal cortex. Now this is a, an important, if you've heard me before I talk about this, I'm sorry, but it's very important in my brain. There are two systems in your brain that do not work at the same time. They're kind of like on a teeter-totter, the mentalizing system and the prefrontal cortex. Now, the prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that handles logic and reasoning, like how long is it going to be till this presentation is over? Or how much money do I have to have in the bank to pay bills? Or how long does it take me to drive somewhere? Or how do I fill this stuff into my suitcase? 
the mentalizing system is the part of the brain that handles thoughts of ourselves and our relationships to others. So we're thinking about ourselves and how everything integrates into our lives, into our stories. These two systems don't work at the same time. Our brains are kind of like a muscles and that the parts that we use more become stronger and faster. In fact, they become, can become up to a hundred times faster at processing with practice. <clears throat> so scientists ask, which system is our default system? Which system are we using more? Which system are we working out more and making faster and stronger? And they ran um, some test subjects through an fMRI machine and they were throwing math questions at them something like every 30 seconds. And even when there was only 30 seconds between math questions, the prefrontal cortex would light up to solve the math question. And then as soon as it was solved, it would shut on and the mentalized system would go on. The mentalizing system was the default system for everyone. They went on then to do further testing and they gave two different groups of people like this paragraph to read about an imaginary person. The first group of people, group A, was told they were going to be given a test, right, about this paragraph. And when they read in the fMRI machine about this imaginary person, they used the prefrontal cortex because they were trying to like memorize it logically. The second group was told that they were going to be trying to hook this person up with a friend. They were going to be playing like Cupid or whatever. They used the mentalizing system when they read about this imaginary person. Which group do you think both groups took the test? Which group do you think did better? Prefrontal cortex one or mentalizing system two? Yeah, it was number two. The mentalizing system group threw them out of the water every time because they were actually thinking about this person in the context of their own lives. And so when we can help our students kind of get into the right brain space, we can really be like, give them some language superpowers. When our brains feel happy, when we feel like we belong, when we feel like we are part of the group, positive motivation impacts brain metabolism, conduction of nerve impulses through the memory areas and the release of neurotransmitters that increase executive function and intention. In other words, dopamine, which is released when we are happy or doing something rewarding, helps the brain learn more and retain it better. The highest level executive thinking, making connections, and aha moments of insight and creative motivation are more likely to occur in an atmosphere of exuberant discovery, where students of all ages retain that kindergarten enthusiasm of embracing each day with the joy of learning. So that's just basically saying, like, if you feel like you belong, if you feel like these people have my back and it's okay to make mistakes and I'm in a safe place, your brain can learn so much better. However, when the brain is stressed, our amygdala, which is in charge of our freeze, fight, or flight reaction, takes over. Even a tiny bit of stress activates it because our brains react to stress in a very similar way that we did when we were like running from lions. So our brains and bodies handle stress in the same way. When it's activated, new sensory information cannot pass through it to access the membrane association circuits. Social pain and physical pain actually activate the same centers in the brain. When we don't feel like we belong or are afraid of being wrong, we can't learn as well. They did this super interesting test. I'm super into studies, if you can't tell. And what they did was, um, but basically what, what they're saying is it doesn't matter if the pain is social or physical. It doesn't matter if an elephant stepped on your foot or your friends were like, no, I don't want to sit with you at lunch. The pain is the same in your brain. Your brain deals with the pain the same way. The only difference in our brains between physical pain and social pain is that the physical pain, um, with physical, with social pain, a set part of our brain lights up to tell us how much it bothers us. With physical pain, it's the same. It lights up to tell us how much it bothers us. But with physical pain, a second center in our brain lights up to tell us where it hurts. But the part that tells us how much it bothers us, whether it's physical or mental pain, is the same. They did a double blind study, and I won't go into all the details just because we don't have time, where they um, were rejecting people socially, and they found that ibuprofen helped lessen the, the stress and the pain of social rejection exactly the same way it does physical pain, which is kind of crazy. So we can't just ignore classroom community. It has to be kind of like a critical piece of what we do. And thank you for the kind comments, Martha and Dulce. Um, this is called the effective filter by Dr. Stephen Krashen and others, and it's defined as a period of an emotional state of stress in students during which they are not responsive to learning and storing new information. And this is the one and only Dr. Krashen, and I totally waited in a very long selfie line for that. It was 100% worth it. By the way, if you go to CI Summit this summer, he is speaking virtually at the CI Summit, and I'm so excited to hear him speak. I do it every time I get a chance.
All right, so let's get into the meat. How do we translate all of this into actions we can use in our classroom? Connecting our students to the world around them. One of the ways I do this, one of the huge pieces of my classroom is class meeting. And it looks a little different um, when I do it with kindergarten versus with the older kids. And I will give you all those examples so you can see how it will translate. When I first um, introduced emotions, and this is actually right from Primaria, which is both a digital elementary program that I've been helping with, I will show them a picture like this, and we will guess at how this kid is feeling. Or like you see on the right side of my screen, even simpler with kind of like the Lego heads. Like I'll say, oh, Mira, look, look at this guy. And I would be pointing at it in class. I can't point it here. Class A is stop, Felice, Felice. And I would make a really big smile too. And I would ask them to guess, what do you think Felice means? And they would call out, and I won't make you do it since it's Saturday, they would call out happy and they would get it. And I always make sure to um, go ahead and translate everything to start because not all of your students will have English as a first language and something that might seem super obvious isn't necessarily going to be. So you need to make sure you translate everything. Cognates are, are helpful, but not necessarily for everyone. And so I would just go through and I would TPR, oh, everyone show me Felice, and I would have everyone show me Felice, everyone show me Triste, and everyone show me Triste, and you can kind of milk it a little bit. If like Terry was showing me Triste and I might be class A, eh? Mira, Terry, look at Terry, it's not Triste. And then I might make Terry act a little bit more and be muy triste, very sad. So you get some practice in with the emotions. With my youngest students, what I then do is I have them sit in a circle and we pass around a stuffed animal or this sign and they get to point to show how they're feeling. And I'll just say it for them the first time. I'll be like, oh, Mike está feliz. Terry está triste. Leila está cansada. And I'll just say it for them the first time around and we'll point at it and we'll all act it out. And they'll just kind of start to get the connections in their brains and understand what these words mean. And it's interesting because everyone's having different emotions and everyone's sharing their genuine, inform their genuine information. They're sharing how they're really feeling. So that's like the first day or two. After the, even a couple of days, students will take over. When I pass them the, the piece of paper or the stuffed animal, sometimes we do a stuffed animal, they'll start saying feliz or triste or cansada. They will fill it in for me. They will start to um, raise their, they will start to mimic you. So especially if you have younger kids, I used to freak out when students were talking, but then I had to make sure I was listening because some of that talking is just mimicking you like a young, young baby would when they're trying to learn a language. So I have to be careful, especially if you have younger students about what you like stamp out and what you um, encourage. And after you've done this for a few days, your kids will start to ask for more. Like they'll say, profe, how do I say I'm hungry? Or how do I say I'm bored? Or how do I say I'm tired? And very, very quickly, you will build up this giant list of comprehensible information that everyone in your class will understand. This is, with my older students, what I would do was I would just project something like this onto the board. And I would say, um, and I would say, just go ahead and raise your hand if you want to share how you're feeling today. And I was at a five minute timer. And it's really shocking, especially when I started, how many kids are willing to share and in fact want to share. Because, you know, kids want to talk to you and this gives you a chance to, to talk with them without losing your language time. And both of them are really important. Now, this is a quick demo I filmed with my own child during um, COVID. So please excuse the, the lighting, et cetera, et cetera. But this is what it sounds like at the very beginning. I'm going to show you kind of the different levels you get as you go. Can everyone hear? Hi. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Erica, I don't hear it. Erica, okay, yeah, there's no audio. give me one second. Let me try and reshare. I think I just forgot to hit the important share sound button. So it's, it's a short video. Give me one second. Here we go. Theron, como Is there sound now? Is it loud enough? Thank you. Theron está feliz. So that is what it looks like at the very beginning where the teacher restates how the student is feeling. In the second video, you can see there's a little bit of progress made and he can state his own feelings, but he can't really expand on it. So that's the very, very first video. Como estas? 
babies. Wait, yet. And that's that's the very beginning. That's just the ba basics. But if you say como estas, and they can give you feliz, or maybe they even say happy in English or whatever your first language is, that's progress. That means they heard that question and they understood. Even if they're not ready to produce, they understood what you meant. Okay, so that's one. As students go, as you go, very naturally, the students will be like, how do I say I'm sick? How do I say I'm tired? And I will just add those. And very quickly, we went from this short little list to like, I think two months into the school year, we had all of these. And this was a whole conversation that everyone in class understood, that everyone was a part of. I um, changed districts a few years ago, and the district I was in, I had had one class of kindergarten for only a year, and I saw a parent in one of my kindergartners a year later, and she told me, we went to a birthday party the summer after she had you, like three months after she was in your class, and the student spoke Spanish, and they had a whole conversation in Spanish. She was blown away by how much her daughter was able to talk a year after being in my classroom, and I guarantee you, it was all from class meeting. It was all this kind of conversation that they were having. So after you have your kind of your expanded vocabulary, your shared vocabulary, then you can start to ask follow-up questions. Like if a kid says they're triste, they're sad, I'll say, oh, por qué? Why? Now my kids do know they're always allowed to say if I ask why, they're always allowed to do this or es un secreto. It's a secret. Because sometimes kids want to share that they're having a hard time, but they don't want to say why because it might be something really private. Or sometimes they'll come up and share with you later and they don't need to share it with everyone else. So the es un secreto, it's a secret, is a really powerful way to let kids sometimes share that they're having a hard time without giving the details that they're not ready to share. So you can ask the follow-up question and then you can also get some story starters. Sometimes kids will say something that's really interesting, like, well, my dog ran away, but my dog came back. And they can be like, oh, well, where do you think your dog went? What's your dog's name? How big is your dog? What does he like? What did he do when he was there? So it can turn into a whole story that's focused on this one student because you heard something interesting during class meeting. I have learned amazing things about my students during class meeting. And, and it feels like a home then. It feels like a safe place. Okay, so here's level two where you've progressed a little bit and you're able to answer, ask some follow up questions. Your responses at first will probably be a mix of Spanish and English or whatever your target language is and whatever the first language is. I always do high fives and encourage any sort of participation. All right, this is level two. Different child. We're going to have another demonstration. And now we have a mini demo. This would probably be a few months more into the school year. Um, and I see my students twice a week for 36 minutes where you would start to see this sort of progress, maybe even mid-year if your students are very beginners. So I might say, como estas? Feliz. Ah, Torin está feliz. Torin, por qué? Because my family is in the house. Ah, so cute. He's feliz because his family is there. So that's the next level. Um, the next thing you can do after you've like kind of layered in the beginning parts that I've told you about is to add in rejoinders. And I learned about rejoinders from the amazing Bryce Hedstrom, who's presenting next, and Grant Boulanger, who's also amazing. And you can find all sorts of videos with Grant doing this on YouTube and Bryce doing this on YouTube with older kids if you want different examples. But rejoinders are basically talking back. Teach the kids to talk back. And I have had people be like, what are they doing? I'm like, they're talking to me in Spanish. So the rejoinders that I have in my classroom are if someone says they're triste, sad, we say, oh, pobrecito, pobrecita, pobrecita, which just means like poor you. And that was my response for sad for a long time until I had a kindergarten student who raised her hand and she shared that her mom had just passed away. And she was genuinely sad. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't go pull Bracita to this kid who is sharing a really deep, painful thing. And she needed to share that every week for several months. So instead of going pull Bracita for her, I came up with un abrazo, which is just a hug. And everyone in class would just go a hug. And we do like kind of like hug fingers in her direction. This became my go-to response for any time kids share something that was genuinely sad. And even kids who are going through really rough things, you can see when, when they get their fingers, like they get the little smile, they get the little, they can feel the hug. So they shared it because they wanted to share it with us. And for us to be able to give them that little bit of love is really big during the day. Um, lots of kids will tell you about things like they have like a karate tournament or a dance contest. So we would, we, 
I had to teach the kids the word ball. So what we started doing, I needed to come up with a way to use it a lot in class. So we would make a ball of luck and throw it at the person when they needed luck. So I'd be like, oh, class, they need good luck. Everyone make a ball of luck. We make an additional ball. And I go one, two, three, throw. We'd all throw it at the person. And they could either catch it or they could fall over. And the kids really, really enjoyed that one too. And I got some extra vocabulary in there um, for something they need congratulations for. We all do felicidades fingers, obviously different into different target language, but congratulations fingers. My abrazo, the hug I've already talked about. If they're angry, we might say por qué, why. Very careful that if they're having a friend problem, they can talk about the problem, but they can't name the friend because they don't want them calling out names from each other in class. We might do some deep breathing, inhale and exhale. But all of these rejoinders are up around the room. I introduce them one at a time. I give the students points for using them, and they become a really awesome part of our classroom. And they use them all the time. Okay. So this is our final demo. And this is kind of what you will get um, once you've been doing this for a while and students can answer your follow-up questions. ¿Cómo estás? Feliz. Ah, ¿por qué? Uh, tengo una gatita. Una gatita. Qué chévere. <laughs> y uh, tu gatita es pequeña, mediana o grande? Pequeña. <laughs> oh, qué preciosa. Y... ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo se llama? ¿Se llama Bob? Star. Ah, se llama Star. La gatita se llama Star. ¿Y de qué color? ¿De qué color es Star? ¿Es azul? Uh, no. Oh. Negro. And I forget if you have orange instead of star. Negro y anaranjado. Oh, uh -huh. me gusta. Gracias. And I apologize for if there are um, non-Spanish speakers today, but I had Killis captions on there and I don't know what happened to them and I don't really have time to mess around with it today. But basically, I asked how she was feeling. She said she was, I can't remember, I think she said excited. And then I said, why? And she said, because of her cat. And then I got to ask her what a cat's name is, what color it is, if it's big or small. And you can expand and change vocabulary of your follow-up questions to fit whatever you happen to be needing your students to study in class, which is super helpful. Okay, with my older students, especially when we were virtual, it was super helpful for me to, I kind of started getting into the habit of making these like como estas charts so they could have all of this and they can look at the picture and match um, the feelings and they really enjoyed this. And with the older kids, if they were not wanting to interact quite as much, having it numbered. So I would say like if they, after the, you know, I had the students who wanted to speak out loud, which there's always some, I would then say, okay, if you didn't answer, show me on your fingers how they're feeling. So they could just hold up their fingers or write in a whiteboard how they're feeling and hold it up so that they don't have to like, they can still share their feelings and you can still see if someone's having a hard time or needs to talk to you extra without having to speak in front of the class. So this is another, and they really like these Como Estas scales. They're just, if you Google how are you scales, you will find a ton of them already made. This is one I made because we were doing kind of a deep dive on Encanto and I kind of, I just really wanted it. But there's tons that are pre-made so you don't have to like start from scratch. And then my students enjoyed it so much that they ended up making their own as a class project. And that was another fun way to kind of involve the kids uh, in, in what we were doing. So how do I assess? This is an assessable task you're doing. Um, with my younger students, we were kind of on a zero through four gradient scale. And so I would just have, when we were doing class meeting, not every day, but often enough that kind of, I'm, kind of I could mark progress, I would have my grade book open and the kids did not know that I was, I was assessing them or taking any kind of measurement, but I would just ask them the question, how are you? And if they had no response, like if I said, how are you? And they were like, my name is Bob, or their faces went blank, that's a zero. They didn't understand the question, so they're not comprehending, they're not ready to input or output, they, they nothing. And really, if you do it the way I'm telling you, there were no kids that were zeros, very, but like very, very early in the school year. One is they respond with one word in English or the target language. Like I say, como estas, how are you? And they say either happy or they can only ever say feliz. They understand the question. That's something. They understand what I'm asking them. That's, that's comprehension. They're not ready really to produce a lot, though, if they can't get beyond one word in English or feliz. So for me, that's a one. Two, if they respond with a variety of words in the target language, like they can give me happy, mad, sad, they, they, they aren't limited to just like this one expression. A three, if they can respond with a variety of words in the target language and they can answer some follow-up questions. 
So they can always answer me when I ask them how they are with a variety so they can properly express their emotions. And if I ask them, oh, how, why are you feeling like that? Or what's your cat's name? They can get some of those answers too. And a four, if they can respond with a variety of words and complete sentences in the target language and they can answer the follow-up questions. So that means they really have the flow of this down and they are good. So then that really, really gives you a, a really good picture of where your students are at with this. And it's really, really simple and low, like a little work for you. With the older kids, a different variation you can do with this, and this, I credit this slide to Christy Lade and William Langley, or Bill Langley, is you can just have these things projected onto the board, and you can have kids come in and they can write their name by the one they did. Or they can move a sticky note with their name on it to the one they did, just depending upon how your classroom setup is. Or you could put this on Pear Deck and they can mark the one you did. And then you could talk about it. You could be like, oh, 10 kids read a book. You could talk about the kids be like, what book did you read? How was it? Um, Two kids celebrated. Who celebrated? Why did you celebrate? What did you eat when you celebrated? And then you can talk about all of these things much the same way I talked about class meeting. Um, little caveat with this one is that if you want to make sure that you have things on here that aren't like big ticket items, like you don't want kids to always be talking about going to the Bahamas and have the kids that don't go anywhere on spring break to be feeling like, oh my gosh. So you want to make sure that you keep these, I would try and keep things that like everyone would do because I don't want anyone feeling bad. That's not the point. This point of this is the opposite to make everyone feel good. And another simpler version of that, if you were not going fast and you just don't have time for that, just write across the top like four different things. Have the kids come in and sign their name. You don't need to make it, you know, we all teachers work way, way, way more than, than we should probably because we'd love our kids, but you don't need to go crazy yet for this one to be super effective for you. And another way you can kind of do this, and I, you probably a lot of you have seen this, is calendar talk. And you can just, and sometimes I would do this for like just a couple of minutes. You might say today, and obviously it's not July, it's very, very much not July. You could say today is and give them the date. And you could say, you know, who is doing something fun tonight? Or what are you doing tonight? And let the kids start to talk to you about what they're doing tonight. And you could say, you know, compare, oh, so-and-so is going to baseball, so-and-so is going to this. You can write all those things down. You can compare, you can contrast. All of this is along the same veins of getting your students listening to each other, building that community, building that ability to stay 90% in the target language because you're spending so much time practicing with it. Another kind of little trick to, to, to tweak this, um, I learned from Marta Yednak, who is amazing. And her podcast, if you are a Spanish teacher and you use Voces Digital, we just added her podcast, Cuéntame, to the Nuestra Historia, so you could access that in all the titles. But you can also just Google her. She's amazing because her Cuéntame podcast is free for everyone. Um, with advanced students, I needed, I wanted to get them talking more. I wanted to kind of pull them into the next level of output when they were ready. These are my kids who were second and third graders, but really for me, that was year three and year four. I had clickers. And what I do with the clickers is I just have a competition per grade level. And each grade level, um, the grade level that has the most points at the end of the month gets an extra recess. You could do like 10 minutes of free time if you have the older kids. And all I do is I walk around with a clicker during class. And anytime I hear them using Spanish, especially if I'm not talking to them, I give them a click. For words I really want them to get using that they're not quite there, I'm like, I want, I have, I am, I need. They get two clicks. So they know those are two click words. So they're like extra excited to use those. It also, because we have these giant numbers on the board, it will be like second grade has 13,233 clicks and fourth grade has, you know, 7,899 clicks. It gives you chances to practice really big numbers. And the kids love it. They get so into it. 10 minutes of free time is nice for you too. And then I always tell them if during that free time that they win at the end of the month, they speak Spanish, I will give them 20 clicks towards the next competition. And then usually they use that free time to speak more Spanish. So they feel like they're getting more, but I am getting the reward of listening to them speak extra Spanish all class. Another way to kind of gather the information and build that classroom community that I like to do at the very beginning of the year is a class survey, an interest survey. I have them fill it out and it's, you know, I am, how they're feeling, how they see themselves. So like a descriptive word, athletic, intelligent, and kind of gives you an like insight into their brain, what they want, what they have, what they like and don't like, somewhere they went during the summer and all of their favorites, like their favorite food, book, movie, video game, music, sport, superpower. And then on the back, and you can't see it on here, they are allowed to tell me 
anything they want. So that's your place where you're going to hear some really interesting things about some of your students. I keep these interest surveys all year. And then if you have a kid who is suddenly checking out and you don't know why, but you need to kind of win them back, I go to the interest survey. I'll be like, oh, Seth really likes sharks. And so suddenly there's going to be a shark in every one of our next six stories. And Seth's going to be the one responsible for making the shark sound effect. And so you being able to like look at these throughout the year, because I usually, I used to have something like 800 students at a time. So I couldn't remember all of these details as much as I wanted to, but having this kind of cheat sheet that you can kind of go and pull through for student details when you need to be encouraging to a particular student is very helpful. You can also use these for a class game, again, low prep, you can pull five of these sheets, only, you know, I would only pick students you know are going to be comfortable with it, have them sit in the front of the classroom and say a few facts about the student, have everyone try and guess who you're saying facts about. This person has three cats. This person has a brother. This person likes video games. And it's a really fun way to kind of highlight a student that, that needs it and to get students listening to each other and to get students realizing how much they have in common. It's a really, really great way to um, do all of the above. Um, one other favorite activity of mine is class pets. And there is a variation. There's a way you can do this um, when they are older. And all I did was I had a stuffed animal per grade level. With older kids, I would have it be a class character you created. And then I would just like laminate it and have like a flat character that they could take around. And we told this, I told the kids this story about the stuffed animal and he'd been living, this poor llama had been living in my classroom all summer and he was sad because he didn't have a name and he didn't want to live there anymore. And do they, did they think they could take him home for one week at a time and speak in Spanish to him and take care of him? And so the kids would each take this llama home for a whole week. Oh, I didn't realize I put these slides in here. Here, These are how I introduce them. I talk about where he's from. So we get to look at the map, get some culture in there, um, get to introduce some important vocabulary, how old he is, what he likes. Um, then we show some pictures. I put a selfie of him and his brother, which the kids love. And then I pick a kid to take it home every week. And the kids take the stuffed animal home. And I always tell the kid, I'm going to give it to someone who I see doing, trying their very best. And it could be someone who helped a friend. It could be someone who had fabulous Spanish. It could be someone who I saw trying really hard, or it could be someone I saw pick up a piece of trash off the floor. So all of these things are, it's, I'm not just gonna reward the kids who are super Spanish speakers. I'm gonna reward anyone who's trying and being an active participant. And so this goes home and the kids get to take a picture. Um, and if they don't print it at home, they just send it to me and I print it for them. And if they don't wanna do that, they can draw a picture and they get to make up all this information about the, the stuffed animal, what his name is, what color he likes, what he likes, what he doesn't like. and then they come back in and they share that at the end of class for about five minutes all sorts of interesting repetitions of really really interesting stuff um important structures all sorts of um relationship building because they're listening to each other and kind of glimpsing each other's lives and um then you take these and you throw them in a free voluntary reading binder like i throw them in a binder and during fbr time or free voluntary reading time the kids can go and they can read about each other and those are some of the most popular free voluntary reading materials in my classroom and this this one this student put a picture of this is a video actually of me reading a spanish book on the ipad that she was watching with the llama which i thought was super adorable and you get, you get to learn the most interesting things about your students, and some of them will answer in English, and some will try Spanish, and that's great because you get to see where they're at. Um, this is what the beginner sheet looked like, and each year I kind of changed the questions a little bit and ramped it up so that I was getting them to practice different things um, that were applicable to what we were studying in class and were interesting to everyone. We have two minutes and I'm going to try with my last few minutes and Chris, tell me if I need to um, need to stop. But this is a video. I had this family who they they really love Spanish and I had them for four years. And this is just an amazing chance to see the progression of their speaking abilities with the class pets. And so here um, and this is shared with permission. This student is in first grade, it was my first year with her, and her brother is in second grade, and her brother is narrating, and she's doing the actions. So her brother is ready for output, and she's ready to show that she understands, but she's not ready to do as much output, but you can see that she understands. It's also pretty adorable. 
here we go. And they made these videos voluntarily and the sheet was the only thing they had to do, but they made these videos voluntarily because they wanted to, because they enjoyed it, because this was play for them. Me gusta caminar, me gusta correr, me gusta bailar, me gusta subir una montaña grande, me gusta saltar, me gusta volar, me gusta cantar, la, 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 me gusta comer galletas. Me gusta dibujir, me gusta jugar el Minecraft, me gusta besar, me gusta dormir. Buenas noches, Lily. I love that video. So that was year one. This is what they were able to do by the time she was done in my class. So this is, I only had her for three years. And I also think this one, I've watched this video a million times and it melts my heart every time. Hola, dinosaurio, como estas? Yo estoy bien, me gusta volar. Me gusta volar también. Yo veo el perro y el jaguar. Va, vamos a hablar con el perro y el jaguar. Vale. Hola, nos gusta volar. Es, es muy, muy fantástico. fantástico. Nosotros podemos uh, ver muchas uh, cosas. ¿Qué puedes ver? ¿Qué puedes ver? Yo puedo ver un tren. Y un carro. Y vegetales. Y un elefante. Tú puedes ver muchas cosas. Yo quiero volar. Uh, trata, trata, trata de, uh, de volar. Uh, pienso que uh, nosotros no podemos volar. Yo también, yo estoy uh, triste. Puedes uh, tratar uh, de volar, uh, tratar uh, uh, de volar, vale, voy a tratar de volar primero. Yo pienso que no puedes volar, pero uh, yo voy a tratar. Fantastico! <laughs> but it's fun! <laughs> How about to try that time There's, I just, I love these videos so much. And, and this is actually Bryce Hedstrom, who is going to be presenting next. So I don't even need to show you this. I'm only having to skip a very little bit. Of I'm sorry, Laura, did you say something? Oh, okay. I um don't have time to show you the rest of the slides, but I will tell you, I taught for 18 years. I taught many different things. I was a classroom teacher. I was a science teacher. Spanish, I always did at least after school Spanish. Spanish was what I did for the most of the time. I used to say that I loved teaching all the things equally because I just loved teaching. But once I started teaching with acquisition-driven instruction, 
that was when I really fell in love. Like now we are so lucky as language teachers because we can teach all of the critical things in a way the brain loves. We can teach our students to appreciate the world. We can teach our students to appreciate our differences. And we can teach our students to appreciate each other and connect to each other and listen to each other. So I hope that this was helpful to some of you. If you have questions and you wanna throw them in the chat, um, you can go ahead and do so. Actually, Susanna, Storyteller's Corner is Amy Rowe. Um, but she asked if I had was going to add more books to Storyteller's Corner. Storyteller's Corner is Amy Rowe, but I will ask her next time I, will, I see her. Um, I hope this was helpful to you on a Saturday. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. And happy Saturday to everyone. I hope everyone has power and has a great rest of your weekend. Mike, over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Erica. That was fantastic. Um, I love the special effects there at the end to see to see the jaguar fly. Um,